started. Does anyone from the audience have any questions? How did you decide uh, upon going into this new area? It has a great deal of movement and it's very, very specific in its graphics. What, what, what motivated you to do this, this style? Oh, the color smear paintings actually come out of uh, homage to color, which I did for my show in Italy, in Tuscany. And I was working on small panels and there is one, I'll put one of those in the show. Uh, the mob one. Right. And I was playing with shapes, transparency, and I would wipe and layer and, and layer and layer until I got what I wanted. What When I paint, uh, the painting kind of takes over and tells me what it needs. So it starts to become almost a person that personality in its own right and it needs something here it tells me that it needs something there and pretty soon i'm layering and wiping and and getting it to become a whole and um, i had no idea that i would work big that way but when it came to doing the color sphere paintings uh, i found that i was working in a similar way um, eight foot. So I would uh, play with shapes and transparency and layers. It's all very layered. I start out with uh, underpainting and I use colors that are either contrasting or will make the color I put over it really glow. And um, even before that, I start out with a pencil drawing on the canvas. And even before that, there's a study, uh, oil on paper. And sometimes there's several studies before I come up with something that I think would uh, work on a big canvas that I'm happy with. So sometimes, like in uh, uh, Color Sphere 7, I did about six or seven studies before I came to something that I thought would work large. Do you feel that each painting, the color, the colors in each painting are conveying a different message? Yes, I think color has its own language. And the thing I love about color is it, it has an emotional value. And like, it, it evokes something deep within me that, uh, that I don't even remember or think about, but it causes a deep emotional reaction. And I play off that. Uh, like green and orange, like what I'm wearing. That is in one of my paintings. And green is such a wonderful color. And there's so many variations of green. In, in Color Sphere 3 green, I put about 20 different greens. And it was wonderful to discover chrome green, Kelly green, uh, chrome green, and uh, sap green, on and on. Um, so many different greens, and then to contrast that with the, um, the opposite on the color wheel is orange. So I try to play that off, green and orange. Um, I learned about um, color from my mother when I was two years old. So I've been playing with color, and it's always a mystery. It's never something that you can learn and, and then you know it. It's, it's always, there's always something new to learn about it. And, and the reaction that you get from certain colors, uh, even certain greens, 
are different so that you can go from a mellow Kelly green into a bitter green blue and contrast not only color but emotions. Um, so color is, is just it's just something I I really live for, and uh, and I learned about it so early in life. Uh, we had a uh, color teacher in, at Otis, and we each had a pack of like two hundred different colors that were still screened, and and the the teacher who had been a student of the student of Joseph Albers said, gave us an assignment right off the bat, first assignment he ever gave us. And he said, find two colors that are direct opposite on the color wheel. He said, this is going to take you at least two weeks. It's really hard. Oh. And I raised my hand and he said, do you have a question? And I said, no, I have the answer. <laughs> and he said no <laughs> and he ran to my uh, chair and he almost fainted because I had the answer in about three seconds but it was very easy for me because color is inherent in my uh, upbringing in my personality in my thinking in my spiritual life um, it's always been a big part of me. So even though the graphics are similar in the whole show, the color combinations are totally different. So each one has a totally different communication. Yeah, that's right, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, shapes are uh, made from gestures. Because I'm very athletic. I like to um, swim. I was a lifeguard. I like to ski. I was a ski instructor. So I'm very athletic. And I like to use my whole body and a gesture. And, and so I start out with um, very athletic gestures, arcs, um, and straight lines that, that zoom down and um, create energy and from that I can plan my color uh, according to the shapes and the uh, and the directions that I've made. Great. So, any more questions? Um, yes, well, I got to see this show of color spheres a week and a half ago and there's a beautiful color of green, blue, in a couple of them. And uh, it's just so gorgeous. And okay. she said it was such a special one. And it's actually very expensive. They should do it so expensive that you get that person in that Oh, uh, that's uh, cobalt blue turquoise. It's like a little tube. All my paintings are little tubes. But they're very expensive. This is fifty dollars a two. Really? For oil paints? Yeah, it's a Dutch old Holland paint. Wow. And it's the most expensive. They keep it under lock and key at the uh, art supply store. Mm -hmm. uh, but the color is I had the idea of the color before I even made the painting. I, I knew I had to do a painting with that color. And so I went to the art store and got a sticker shop immediately when I picked it up. And um, But it's worth it because it's a color that's so mysterious and beautiful. And it's hard to fail with that color. So it's a color you couldn't have possibly mixed yourself. You cannot mix with that color. Yeah. At least I can. Yeah. But I can mix a lot of colors. Right. But that color is, is really, I don't know how they got it. Yeah. Certain that interesting. What's the name of the color again? Cobalt. Yes. Cobalt. Cobalt blue was Matisse's number one color. Yes, I love Matisse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I come from a long line of color painters. 
uh, starting with Turner and going through Rothko and Joseph Albers, of course, who I kind of studied with as a student of a student of, because he continued to give exercises, which I continued to do in five minutes and then leave the class. But um, still, um, I, I credit my mother really at um, getting me interested at age two and all I wanted to do was color with crayons. And whenever she went downtown, she said, what can I get you? And I said, more color crayons. <laughs> It's interesting that that color, the color blue, um, is brought up in a question because actually that was a question I was going to ask. I see that it is a re recurring um, color in your series. Um, but I want to ask you uh, spiritually and um, what does the color blue mean to you? What uh, emotion does it ignite within you? Well, color is... Blue is the color of the sky and the color of water. And it has a kind of depth for me of emotion. Um, it's very, uh, it's a lovely, lovely color. And it has uh, depth and emotion and, and, and beauty for me. And I can make it look like water in the sky. I can make it look like uh, almost anything. And I love to make it a recessive color where um, sometimes red, for instance, is the color that comes out, but I can make it a recessive color. I love to play with color that way because uh, there's trite things about color that you might have heard, but I like to play with color and prove that that's wrong, that you can make color do almost anything. Yes, ma'am. I didn't know how it could have lived almost a century and been in the design, I shouldn't have written about design. Art never asked this before, which is the oil color to fade over time. Well, these colors I use are, are pretty light fast. Um, they're the best colors you can buy. And I've had paintings 25 years that have not faded. And the old, old masters, I mean, they all painted with oils. Yeah. There was nothing else, so they lasted hundreds of years. Acrylics may not last quite as long because they're water things. Right. I think it depends how you use them. When I was using acrylics, I was using lots of Roblex with it. And uh, the paintings I used are that I did the Black Forest, for instance. Right. Um, they're um, pretty sturdy. You have one. Right? Yeah. So, and uh, I don't think they're ever going to uh, fade away. They're, they're plastic, just like plastic water bottle. They see, you know, I have one of Susan's paintings that I got 30 years ago, one of her Roblox, and it's hanging right next to my bed. So I see it when I go to sleep and I see it when I wake up and it changes color. You told me that. Yes, the light changes <laughs> on. Right. Yeah. And Carol has one of my works also. Carol yeah. has a beautiful. Uh, but I will talk about Joe's painting first. Um, the Black Forest series was done for my grandparents that were starved to death in Bergen Belsen concentration camp, where they lasted over a little over two years and lost pretty much all their weight before they died of uh, starvation and typhus. And it was only two weeks later that the camp was liberated by the British troops. And um, I grew up with this uh, fact that uh, my grandparents were uh, so treated so horribly and died so unnecessarily. Um, and I wanted to do an homage to them. Um, my grandmother was a poet and, and she could draw and she liked to draw. So 
she knew Kata Kowitz, who was a great woman artist. And, um, and Kata gave her some sketches and drawings. And I didn't, I never got them because of Hitler. Uh, but uh, my mother brought over beautiful furniture and rugs and china plates and paintings. So I grew up in a museum and uh, because of my grandmother. And I really uh, think my grandmother, I feel my grandmother is kind of an angel watching over me at times because I seem to get through so many life-threatening situations where um, I almost die, but I never die. So I think she's watching over me um, uh, whenever I feel like I'm gonna run out of money, something happens. And <laughs> I, I really feel she's, she's there with me all the time. So I, I did this series for them, um, Black Forest. And um, Lonnie Gans uh, was my dealer at the time. And Nick Wilder was the best dealer in town. He and uh, James Corcoran were on Santa Monica Boulevard. They were the two top dealers. And Nick Wilder decided to be an artist himself. So after representing the best artists like Ron Davis, Joe Good, on and on like that, he he closed. He decided to close up his shop and move to New York. So Lonnie Gans ran in there and rented the place, and she did the Black Forest show. Oh, I never knew that. And it was such a hit. Uh, Demon Corn came. Buses of people came from all over. Um, it was just a smash hit, and most of the paintings got sold. Um, Robert Rowan uh, was my patron at the time. He was a very big collector in Pasadena. And he uh, bought quite a few of them. Actually, I met him uh, in, a, in a kind of uh, cute way. Uh, I was uh, really, really broke. And I was having a show in New York on Madison Avenue. So I called him up cold and I said, um, I'm an artist and I live near you in Eagle Rock. And he said, is that where the eagle is on the mountain? <laughs> and I said, yes, I used to be at the top, but I fell down. <laughs> so he said, why don't you come over? I'm eating breakfast. So I went over to his big house in Pasadena and I'm feeding in photos of my work and he's feeding me vitamins back and forth. And he said, I like this work very much. And I said, I just, I just need a little help. And he said, 600 a month for two years. And so he just started paying me at, against paintings. And he did buy Cross Current, but then he decided to trade it for number six, Black Forest number six, which you have, Joel, in your house right now. Oh, I didn't realize it was from his collection. And it was his favorite painting. <laughs> yeah. And he hung it right in his dining room where he had hung Jill Zalitsky and Helen Frankenthaler and Frank Stella and on and on. And here is this Black Horse painting that you have in your, your bedroom now. Um, he loved that painting. It, it's about eight feet tall. Well, it's, uh, I think it's six by four. Oh, really? I yeah. thought it was bigger than that. But uh, yeah, so uh, I painted number seven, had a, had a really funny, this is a funny story about Black Forest Seven. Uh, I painted uh, all the Black Forest paintings in the studio up the street next to the Gibbons Auto Body. At six in the morning, the whole studio caught fire. And I got a call and I ran down and there was a ring of red flames and black smoke and the firemen were there and they said, don't go in. And I said, I have to go in and get my paintings. And my assistant showed up and we had 50 paintings out on the sidewalk in about 10 minutes. And I had no idea what was gonna happen to them and this woman came running from across the street and she said, I have a studio in this thrift store across the street. 
and you can borrow it. So we took the paintings across the street and the Black Forest paintings were, were in that fire and they got rescued. So number seven already had a history and then it got in the show in Flanagan's and then it was sold to a bank, Union Bank of Switzerland downtown, where it had a great job in the lobby. So it had an office job. <laughs> <laughs> then I had a show of my oil beginning oil paintings downtown and Jean-Luc Strom who had bought the Black Forest painting decided to trade it for a new oil painting so poor Black Forest 7 came back to the studio losing its office job oh. unemployed back at the studio so then uh, an architect and his wife wanted to borrow the painting. They were having a dinner party. So uh, the, the, the thrift store had very uh, flimsy doors. They were like red, but they were, you know, very flimsy. And so I put the Black Forest painting right by the door so that in the morning I could drive up and just load it up into my truck. And when I came to the studio the next morning, the doors were open and the painting was gone. Oh, oh my gosh. So I was really upset. I called the police and they sent this uh, detective from La Cienega who did art. And he said, it's probably someone within a 10 mile radius <laughs> who took this painting. So I put up a sign, reward $200 or return a Black Forest 7. I put that on my door. And then I had this dream. I dreamed that a Mexican guy ran into my studio and said he had my painting. Two weeks later, a Mexican guy ran into my studio. I said, don't tell me you have the painting. <laughs> he said, my friend took it. I said, I don't care, here's some money. When you bring it back, I'll give you the rest of the money. So he brought Black Forest Seven back in this old pickup truck. And um, I ran down to the uh, bank and got him some money. I didn't give him the whole amount. I said, the police are after you. And he ran off. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a provenance for that painting. I'm not even through yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the, the old thrift store was bought by the city of LA and they wanted us out. So they sent this guy once a month to tell us to get out. <laughs> and we, we just call him some kind of clown. You know, we didn't pay any attention to him. We laughed at him. But one day I got a letter that said from the city, you have to get out of here. We're, we're, we're going to do something with the building and you have to leave. So I looked in the LA Times and there was a building down the street for sale and they only advertised it one time in the LA Times. That was the day I picked up the, the paper. So um, I ran down and the real estate guy had his coffee cup and he said, do you have the money? I said, no, but I'm gonna get it. Because it was a beautiful place. It, it was just what I wanted. Skylights, beautiful, 1,600 square feet, perfect. Yeah, so um, I, I had no money, but I found a way to borrow it against my house, and my mother helped me. And so then we started remodeling it, and the money just poured out. You know, when you remodel, you need, you know, 100 this and 50 that, and skylights and wood and right. and so I started chanting I chant Buddhism and I was chanting for thir at least thirteen thousand dollars by sometime in April and I in March I made two hundred dollars so I'm chanting I don't care if it's the first of April or the middle or the end I need thirteen thousand dollars mm -hmm. and so the first thing that happened was in San Francisco, I was uh, working with the Museum Artist Gallery and 
they rented and sold my work. And there's a one couple in Carmel that had three of my big seven foot paintings. And they had them three months with three months renewal. And then they had them some more. And I said, no, they can't have them more than three months with three months renewal. Either they buy those paintings or I want them back. And I immediately got a check for $7,500. Then um, Michael uh, Todd, the sculptor, called me and said that there's a couple that want to come by. And they've been wanting to come by your studio for a couple of years. Can they come by? And I said, how about Sunday? And they came on Sunday. And they loved Black Force 7 but they loved three other paintings and they were just beginning collectors. There was a small one. So uh, we loaded them in the truck and uh, we drove to their beautiful house in Brentwood with the lap pool. It was really, really gorgeous. And they put up the black forest look so stunning in their house, uh, but they chose a small painting. And so they gave me a check for 5,000. Well, seven and five, it's only 12,500. And I'm chanting for 13. Who was the couple? And it was Cliff and Mandy That's Einstein. I was going to say it was Cliff and Mandy. <laughs> 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 so they were up, uh, you know, late, just had to light the painting just mm -hmm. right. And they took us mm -hmm. to a fancy restaurant. And, and by the time I got home, it was like two in the morning. So I'm sleeping in and the phone rings and this voice said, do you want more money? And I think I must be dreaming, right? And it was Amanda Einstein and she said, we couldn't sleep thinking about that black horse painting. <laughs> and if you bring it, we'll trade. And so I brought it over and they gave me a check for $10,000. And by April 1st, I had $17,500. And also you should mention that Cliff and Mandy Einstein, they built what is an incredible gallery on top of their house. I mean, it's like a museum and that's where Susan's painting is. Well, the story's not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> So, continued about the Black Forest. Yeah, so that's <laughs> Black Forest 7. Yes. So the painting did very well in their house. Everybody loved it. But they decided uh, to keep collecting and they needed more room. So they decided to donate it. Where should we donate it? So various museums were thinking about it. But the Skirball Museum ran over. And that's where it is in the museum, yeah. at Skirbo Museum. Oh, how great. Awesome. That's interesting because Cliff was president at one time of, of MOCA downtown, uh -huh. Museum of Contemporary Art. Yeah. That is so, such a, not just a um, colorful story, but as I said before, such a spiritual aspect and it's such a breath of fresh air to meet someone who definitely has um, the power of the mind and color and a spiritual aspect. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And I agree. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that happiness, even though I don't know what it is, I'm going to achieve the of that forest and mine, which is um, her and Cliff's Earth slide. Earth slide and earth slide. But it, whatever it resonates with or warns about later, it's, there's a happiness and joy I see in the things which is wonderful. But uh, the thing I wanted to mention was I just love the way Susan talks. She talks like she writes and she wrote a novel. Well, it's not a novel, it was a true life story. But the way she writes is like how she talks and the sentences are just right and it suspense, suspense for every paragraph just about. And that one is that I'm thinking about is uh, the uh, accident. The accident uh, stage. And that's so good. It is the thing she got, the thing she got with the sentence. Is that the wonderful doctor and now suicide? Yeah. That's, all. that's your place. That's where you are now in the skylight and tall ceiling. Yes. Oh, that, it's just wonderful. So your mother saw that post. Yes. Good. Yes, there's a story about Carol studio. 
Carol's piece also. Carol has an Ursula I drawing uh, that I did actually for a couple in Florida that went to uh, the art fair where um, I have a gallery in Florida that represents me, Quigley and company. And uh, they, they took my work to an art fair and this couple came by and they wanted a long, thin drawing. It had to have turquoise and um, magenta and yellow and green. And so uh, I usually asked for a down payment and they wouldn't give a down payment. So I already knew probably that they wouldn't buy it. But I did it anyway because uh, I wanted to please the gallery. I, I was new to that gallery and I didn't want to tell them, no, I, I can't do it. So I did it anyway. I did several versions and um, they kept saying, oh, I know they'll buy it. I know they'll buy it. So uh, when I finished, we had a photograph and guess what? They didn't buy it. <laughs> so I was, I was kind of uh, irritated, but um, I put in my show with Ohm when it was at the other space in Bergamont and Carol came and she bought it. And it looks so, Carol has the most beautiful home you could ever imagine. It's very simple. I just bought one room in the middle of the forest in the city and built the house and I did it. And I would believe it not to own it or possess much or anything. And also I think I think it's lost. So I absolutely came out to the G gallery and see the show, but absolutely saying it yes, I don't I don't need anything or want anything and I, I I'm not investing in any acquisitions at all. <laughs> okay. And I saw this meeting and that I I mean, I have no wall space either. If I went in and I saw this wall, it had slime in it, just, oh, it just reminded me so much of when I was a little girl and looking for pebbles in the bottom of the room. It's just so beautiful. I just had to buy it. And so it was really, and the thing is, one wall of my, it got up over my window seat. It had nothing on it, purposely, because I didn't like it. Anyway, it went, it just fit perfectly. And it also uh, just brings the outside in as I want the windows to do. I just want to sit there in the trees and not, not have too much. And uh, it's so beautiful. I, I, it's just beautiful. Every time I look at it, it's just so beautiful. She she uh, created that when we were working with uh, a medium. It, uh, it's more helpful for you than what you've been painting with before. So we tried that kind of behind the sun. Anyway, it, it, it doesn't look like it's faded, and it's not in the sun. It, it, it light is light. But it, it seems to be holding up pretty well. Yeah, I think you, I don't think it'll fade very much at all. And it brings her window. She has a beautiful Buff and Hensman house in Pasadena. It's to die for. And she has this incredible salon. We used to be able to go over there. Um, now she has it on Zoom, but. Um, well, there was the second Sunday of every month, but it, it had like a year and a half ago, we had to start Zooming it. And uh, it works out really well there too. But of course, it's wonderful. But she said the house is more people than she already is. Yeah. So but she, she does have this window seat oh, it's so overlooking the garden, and then we put the, the lime green oh, wow. uh, drawing there, and it just brings the garden right into the house. Oh, I'm so happy. And it was expensive. I mean, I just, I made me so happy to say, okay, I'm going to get it. I mean, <laughs> he's, and again, we had to get a little bit of the apartment, so we put it. But that was really, really, really uh, very happy decision. But it's wonderful. Definitely. Uh, congratulations to you. I can tell you have such a beautiful emotional attachment to it. And speaking of medium, um, before you used a different medium, I noticed uh, now you use crayon and oil. Um, why? Well, that's a good story, too. Uh, after I did... Uh, 17 black forest paintings. I couldn't do 18 because I got very sick from the uh, bell plates. Mm -hmm. I, I developed a 
lump in my neck and lost all my energy. And I went to UCLA as an outpatient and they said, it's right on the verge of cancer. And if you keep using this material, you will have cancer. And so I had to stop using the, the material. And Robert Rowland said, I'll buy everything that you do with Broplex. You can imagine how hard it was to give up Broplex because I had a whole system. I think I got better color than anybody using acrylic because I had a paint consultant giving me water, kitchen breakers and, and chemicals. And, and he, he said, try this and try that. And he, he really got into it. And um, I got the most brilliant color. Plus it made a glass-like layer and then I could sand it. And I could put another layer. And then you could see through all the layers and it was like working with stained glass. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it was incredible. And uh, I had to give it up, which was really kind of heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, and I have not a clue what to do, but uh, I had these little sketchbook drawings that Finley put up when I showed on Madison Avenue in New York. And uh, I decided to blow them up. So I blew them up to not quite, um, the 50 by 38 inch size, because that was paper I found later from Wally Dawes, uh, Mr. Paper. Uh, but um, I did, I just drew and uh, I had no idea what was going to happen to me. But at the end of the year, uh, this woman named Betty uh, said my, my mother's a curator at Albright Knox Museum in Buffalo and she'd love to see your work. And so I got a show of 30 drawings at Albright Knox, and it was really incredible because you walk in the museum immediately, you see the little sketchbook drawings going up to bigger and bigger. And, uh, and then a whole glassed-in room of crayon. Uh, it was just incredible, 30 drawings uh, right at the entrance, and um, they sold five of them for me. And uh, I rented a car and I drove all around the east and saw Niagara Falls without a honeymoon. <laughs> and uh, Canada, I met a really nice uh, guy named Mark and we toured around Toronto and um, it was really, really great. But when I came back, I wanted to use oil paint. Um, I wanted to switch to oils, but there was nothing in the art store that I could Used because everything was too fumey for yeah. me. Uh, so I couldn't use any fumes at all. And so I was at a loss what to do, but I started doing research. And one of my friends suggested going to a health food store where I found flaxseed oil. Mm -hmm. And I started using it. Uh, it's made in Canada by Robert Gaffney at Omega Nutrition, who makes health food. And um, I really liked using it. So I I wrote a letter to him and asked him if he could send me a gallon of it. And he uh, sent me a gallon and he also came to my studio and he said, how do you make linseed oil? And I said, well, I think it's only that you uh, put it in a tank, the solids drop out and then you got linseed oil. So he started making linseed oil for me. And it's not like what you get in the hardware store because in the hardware store, it's very fumey because they use uh, a horrible thinner called hexane to get the oil out of the seed. But what he does is cold presses it in the dark room, uh, organic seeds. And, uh, and then he lets it sit down. And he further vacuumed out the uh, fatty acids. So it's, it's almost like working with water. It's really beautiful. And I also make the thicker one because we have the um, pure flow and then we have the heavy glazing. The heavy glazing, I make a mayonnaise in my blender with egg. It's, the recipe is, I'm not going to hide it. Okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's uh, one whole egg and three egg yolks. And then you uh, blend it up and then you pour the linseed oil very slowly until it thickens. And don't go past that because then it'll turn like milk. So you have to be really careful and get it as soon as it's thick turn it off the blender and um, it makes a, a like a creamy medium and um, it has no fumes. And then uh, instead of turpentine, I asked Bryce Martin, who was out here 
working, uh, what he used, and he said orange terpenes. And that's made from orange rinds and uh, has no uh, fumes. It has a nice, delicate orange smell. And so if you come to my studio and I'm working eight feet, there's no fumes in my studio. Well, the only thing about that is we're not able to get the cold press and answer like that. <laughs> yeah, no, you can get it. You can get it now. Yeah, you okay. can order it. That's awesome. What a great, great story. It seems like you just ask and it, the universe provides. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. <laughs> yes. It doesn't matter from money to paints, right? <laughs> so uh, my next question, if no one else has one. Um, you graduated with, with honors from the University of Nevada uh, with uh, a degree in psychology and art. Um, how do you incorporate or how does psychology and art play a role in your art that you create? Um, yeah, the emotions are what I use uh, as well as color. So if you look at my crayon drawings, you can see the emotional uh, Layering that I do, uh, especially in the first slide drops, I do a lot of emotional, uh, whatever I'm feeling comes out. And if I'm feeling pain, that comes out. If I'm feeling joy, I can layer emotions the same way as I layer pain. It's beautiful. Do you play music or have silence and quiet? Yeah, I like classical music now. I used to use rock music when I was doing that for it. But uh, the older I get, the more I appreciate classical music. So that's what I listen to. And what is your favorite piece that you've done? You know, I've done so much work. Um, recently, I had to. Um, I couldn't open the paper drawer because it was so heavy. <laughs> drawings. I had to take about 200 drawings out and uh, ship those drawings to a different drawer and put the unused paper, which was you know, very not much, <laughs> in that drawer in order to get it out. So um, I have now uh, like 500. And 45 or 50 collectors. Uh, plus, I have a storage area full of uh, paintings, and my studio is stacked with paintings. And my two paper drawers are stacked, plus, I have another paper drawer. So, I, I have a lot of trouble telling you which one is my favorite. <laughs> I think they're all my babies. I can see that. <laughs> Um, it's obvious that you uh, put a lot of energy and emotion in your pieces. So um, I can see that uh, you wouldn't necessarily have a favorite. One. What about a favorite series? Or uh, I'm sure Black Forest was a very meaningful series for you. Um, is there one of the Black Forest series uh, aside from number seven? <laughs> that um, Number six. Number six. I've left it to you in my room. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I, I think, uh, no, I mean, not everything I do turns out like uh, perfect or wonderful. And once in a while, I have to throw something away, but um, they're all my favorites. You know, they've all had their uh, evolution, their story, and their emotion. And uh, and it's always a surprise to me what happens next. So uh, I really can't put that down. Now it's interesting. Oh, I love you, Carol. Well, he's a, he's like, he directs me and guides me. I think he's so part of that is like he's hurting me. Like if I fly down to the map, that's nice. It would certainly not. He would have to get his mouth around my legs and my arms. He's holding me. There's no cap to do whatever he wants to do. Um, I, a few years ago, uh, he did uh, some beautiful paintings. It's 
like a hidden uh, Buddha inside the swirls. Mm. And that was very interesting to do that. And I usually, because that was more figurative. Even though I see things, you know, I make a story in my head with each of the things that I look at. So much there. But um, anyway, if you try it and then stop, enjoy it and then stop. Yeah, once in a while, Buddha comes out and I paint. Um, I did a, uh, a oil on paper for my contractor for his bathroom. <laughs> and uh, a Buddha came into that. And he just loved it. I love that. Thank you. So, how many of those have you done? I have a clue. I, I don't even know how many works I've done. No, yeah, that's a very, if you love doing it, I just like to think of it. Fine. Yeah. 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 To me, it would be the answer to me. Something very marvelous and prayerful. Yeah, I'm very blessed to love what I do. Yes. And once I was at the gym, Jacqueline, so remember Jacqueline? And and I said it out loud, I can't wait to get to work in the morning. And everybody looked at me like, what? What kind of alien is she? <laughs> I can only imagine. But art and artsy people and people who are into arts and connoisseurs of it and collectors, we are those type of people. We just really get excited about a color palette or a new series or new collection. It's just in us, you know? Um, I want to ask one question that um, we're going to tread lightly on, but I have to ask this question. Um, actually, someone actually asked me to ask this question, and I want to know for myself. So um, do your works comment on contemporary social or political issues? Well, we wrote a, a book, COVID-19, A Natural Approach, which is very contemporary. And um, I got through COVID myself using the information as we were writing the book. So um, I wrote the book, Keep Your Breast, Preventing Breast Cancer the Natural Way. And that was a big hit. Um, it's in a six printing, three languages. And I, out of that, I got a trip to Germany and Holland uh, when it was printed in different languages. And um, I survived cancer. Uh, I got a trip to uh, Glasgow, Scotland to talk to the BBC. So um, mostly my current obsessions um, with COVID-19, a natural approach, and it's very easy to get through COVID if you know how. Um, that's on Amazon if anyone wants to read it. Um, uh, mostly the current uh, things that I my current current things go into my writing. Awesome. That's, that's, that's beautiful. And it's beautiful to be a writer as well as an artist. I think they kind of go hand in hand sometimes. Well, it's got me around the world. I uh, also spoke in Canada twice at the mm -hmm. World Conference on Breast Cancer, once in uh, Ontario, once in um, Ottawa, where they have that gorgeous museum. Mm -hmm. So I got to see some art there. Um, and I got to be on national TV in uh, Canada. And I've been on national TV in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And that was my first and only limo ride. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get our limo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I was on um, Kirk and Chase show. And uh, they picked me up in the limo and they drove me to the um, Sheraton National Hotel and uh, there was a swimming pool and yes. it didn't open until 10 and I had to be at the studio like 5 in the morning. Um, so I climbed over the fence and swam. <laughs> and then I did my makeup and went to the studio and they said, now it's time to do your makeup. I said, I already did my makeup. And they said, oh, no, you didn't. And they have this big pot of pancake mixer. They go, 
I know all about the Sheraton in Nashville. I'm a graduate of Fisk University. Oh, so yeah, we would go to Sheraton uh, not too far from Vanderbilt. So um, awesome. Cool. <laughs> Nashville's a cool city. <laughs> I don't miss the South. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Are there any more questions? What? Since you mix up the egg and the beater, is that a form of gesso? Sorry, she used to do that years ago. The gesso, the whose egg? I'm going to ask them because that is almost egg. Yeah, gesso I use is um, is still acrylic, but it's mostly white um, pigment and chalk. So it's uh, I do that. To just of the canvas. I use rabbitskin glue first. This is very traditional. I don't think any other artists still use rabbitskin glue, but it really protects the canvas. And sometimes I use linen, so it really protects it. And then uh, we use several coats of gesso and sand in between and make a really smooth, beautiful surface. And then uh, when I work with the um, egg tempera, Egg. Oh, egg pepper. That's yeah, it's, it's, yeah, eggs have been traditionally used, and uh, they made fun of Turner because uh, he used eggs, uh, he used uh, currant jelly, he used chocolate, he used the whole kitchen thing, and they just uh, made a big cartoon about it uh, because they didn't understand what he was doing. But um, his paintings have held up fine with all his kitchen stuff, and um. He was really ahead of his time. And an uh, interesting story is I, I went to England. I went to uh, the British Museum. And I said, do you have any Turner watercolors? And they said, which one do you want to see? We have 19,000. Oh. Wow. And so I went to the library. And they brought me down a stack, just matted, no glass. And I made notes. And then I nod my head. And they bring me another stack. And I did that for two weeks. Oh just studying Turner. And then when I got done, I was ready to leave. This old librarian came up to me and he said, I have to tell you that another artist did exactly what you just did. It was Rothko. Wow. And Rothko said, I hope Turner doesn't sue me most numerously. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that interesting? You and Rothko, these big areas of color. We think of Turner, of course, his color is moving straight was very pictorial, except that, of course, the sky is fascinating. Yeah. spent so much time with, with the turn and the way, it's, it's so figurative, except that it's, it's color and it's words. Yeah, but the end of his life, he did abstract painting. Yeah. And yeah, he did watercolors that were just like yellow, uh, this guy with the yellow streak and then some just blue in the water. And, and he was ridiculed. They didn't understand, or the painting would be almost white, like Robert Ryan. And, he, and they just made fun of him. And I think this was partly why he died at 76, because oh, yeah. his health deteriorated, because he was used to being. He was a member of the Academy at age 14. And so he was uh, very respected and he wasn't being hurt. He was supposed to be hurt. Right, exactly. And at the end of your career, I can only imagine what that could do to you mentally. Oh, yeah. But do you think so, that yeah. abstract was kind of looked at in the same way these days? It's not maybe taken as, as, as seriously as it should be? Or what do you think over the over time, do you think the attitude towards abstract has changed? Well, uh, you know, there's cycles that goes through mm -hmm. abstract, figurative abstract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a tendency not to uh, pursue current trends in my art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just uh, follow my own direction, and um, you know, someday people will see the whole thing, hopefully, in a big retrospective. They'll see that coheres together. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, that's a beautiful night to end. Um, yes, yes, yes. 
What the wind? Maybe the last question. This is the question no one's really asked. And in my readings, I didn't really get get the, the final um, uh, answer. Um, I understand that your mother was a person that loved color and was an artist in her own right. Um, what, when did you say, okay, this is what I'm going to be, I'm an artist and this is me? What, what when, when, <laughs> when did that occur? I, I had to uh, buy off relatives and friends um, sometimes to continue to be an artist. I don't think anybody quite understands uh, what the artist's life is like unless they live it themselves. And it's very hard. It's um, feasts and famine. Um, you sell something and you think you have it made. And then months go by and nothing happens. And that money goes down the drain into uh, plain old bills, everyday bills. And, um, yeah, so I had many chances to quote unquote make it, but it happened in my 30s and I just wasn't ready when I showed on Madison Avenue and thinly sold every painting but one and most of the drawings. Uh, then uh, Emmerich and Nerler got interested and um, Lisa Dennison who bought Blue Branches for Van Gogh, a big seven foot Roplex painting, offered me a show at the Guggenheim Museum. and. Uh, it never happened because I just wasn't ready. And at age 30, I thought, I want to wait till I'm 60 oh, and have the work really developed. And I think on the one hand, it was a good decision. On the other hand, maybe it was stupid, but um, I threw away uh, all these opportunities so that I could live a long life. Mm. And, and we all know about Eva Hess who, uh, died in her 30s because of the plastic materials she was using. Um, I didn't want to be Eva Hess. Uh, she got into the museum, she got this collector and that collector, and she knew the material was killing her. And yet she continued to use it. I had to make the decision that I wanted a long life, that I uh, had to give up the Roplex, even though it was my livelihood, that I had to explore what else I could do and that I had to grow as an artist and that I had to uh, give up the fame and fortune and just continue at my own pace. And that was very hard, it's still hard. I understand. Well, if there are no more questions, we will end it here. Thank you guys so much for coming out and the great questions. Thank you collectors. Thank you, Ms. Susan Moss. Um, it's been an honor and an absolute privilege to sit here and interview you and speak candidly about your artwork, which I love. I absolutely love. So thank you guys. And on behalf of BG Galleries, we thank you and good night. <laughs> thank you. One I've never knew.